All right. Hello. Uh, welcome to episode three of our Power of Product Data series. Today's episode is how to get more than a thousand words from your product images. I am Chantal Swizer. I'm a principal taxonomist with Early Information Science, and joining me is Jason Hine, our Director of Delivery. Hey, Jason, how you doing? I'm doing great, Chantal. Super excited to talk about images today. I'm giddy. <laughs> very good, very good. So uh, today we're going to cover why you need images, where to get them, what's the style guide, and why is that vital to image governance. But before we get started, uh, let's take a poll. We would like to know where you are in your product data journey. Are you just getting started? Or are you well on your way to great product data? So if you could please uh, do that, that would be wonderful. It's a one question poll. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to fill your day with polls. That's boring. <laughs> very, very true. All right. So a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, we want to make sure those are the right words. So uh, Jason, what can you tell us about what images bring to the table? So images are hugely powerful, and the research is actually showing it's getting more powerful uh, as users get more comfortable going online. Uh, and one of the things that we, we talk with clients a lot about is like, hey, I've, I've got a website. I'm trying to get customers to engage more with it. One of the first questions we have is, well, all right, talk to us about your images. What do you have? And, and let's look at why, right? So here's an example of Let's do a landing page or you do a search, a keyword search. You, you go to – here's a page that lists all the results uh, that come up for that, that query. And this is not a necessarily a, uh, an unfamiliar one, but Chantal, as you have seen this in the past with clients, what, what jumps out at you here? Well, of course, images. And then I also noticed that the descriptions aren't very descriptive. And when you see this price point, we're looking at $2,000, $4,000 items, I'm going to want to be very confident in my purchasing decision. And if I just have a part number to go off of without an image to reinforce that selection, I'm not going to want to put that item in my cart. Especially if it's a new company you haven't bought from before or you are a relatively new person in the, into the space. Yeah, that's, it's the research that, that I've done um, – uh, in the past, but it highlights the impact that adding that image has. If you have a product on a landing page like this that doesn't have an image, and then you add an image to it, what we found is uh, the likelihood that a user uh, clicks on that product will increase by over 300% just by adding an image. doesn't even need to be a great image, just needs to be an image. Because that image it, it provides reinforcement. It, it adds confidence to that user that, yeah, you know what, that thing in the description, even if the description is kind of hard to read, I see that picture, I confirm that, ah, okay, yes, now I'm confident. Now this, this reality of the, the impact of images is getting pretty, pretty well known. And for example, example uh, Amazon recently basically made a change in that if you load SKUs into Amazon now that don't have an image, uh, they will be suppressed from results pages uh, for at least – uh, a few of the categories that I, I built when I was there. So it's, it is a really powerful thing. And if you, if you have an experience that, that hasn't prioritized images, now's the time to rethink that. Now you compare that to something like this. And this Chantal, this is an example you just shared with me recently about, all right, hey, now we've got an experience where the images are there. And, and talk about how that shifted your, your discovery path when you were shopping intensely. So when I, when I was looking for my tents, I was trying to look at specific attributes. And really from the images, you can garner a bunch of those attributes just by looking at the picture, like the number of poles, uh, the, number, the amount of headspace you're going to have when you're inside of your tent, the kind of rain fly that you have um, to protect over your tent and possibly the entryway to your tent. So you can get all this information just by looking at the image rather than having to look at the filters. And you can get all this information at one time. And it was a great way to help me make my 10 selection. And I'm going to be sleeping in that one in the lower bottom middle um, tomorrow night. All right. Wow. That's talk and it's about accelerating the, the rate at which you get from here's my results to the thing I'm going to buy. That's what we're trying to do when thinking strategically about images is how fast, how can we speed up that process of, Here's the world of options to here's one you want to consider. Multiplier. 
Yeah, that is very impressive that an image has that much impact. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, but it's, it's, and it's not just having an image. Yes, having an image helps, whether it's good or bad. But if it's a bad image, it's not going to help as much as a good image. And here's two live examples that I pulled a couple days ago from the Amazon selection of countersinks. And you can see the impact of an image that is well thought out, highly stylized, you know, very, very clear what it is on top. And then you have this, it's another countersink, um, but it looks like the image is actually, I think it's rotated 90 degrees and it's on a box on a workbench somewhere. And, and I'm oh, hoping yeah. that's the guy's knee. Ah, I think it's his elbow. No, it's yeah, an elbow. It's an elbow. Yeah. I and, thought and I would have no idea that was a countersink. Right. Regardless, I am going to be a little skeptical of that second image, and I'm probably not going to select on it because of the, uh, the quality of the image itself. Uh, I'm not as confident about that second one as I am the first. <clears throat> but so that's just dealing with quality on the results page. But the, in, the quality of your images is important even once you get to a detail page. So you have high quality images on the main, but reinforcing, again, that message of reinforcement and adding confidence. So this is an end mill, which is a different kind of cutting tool, and there's four different shots of this product, each of which are designed to feature different features or different components. And each one of those is designed very strategically to highlight those features. Um, you know, they're all designed with uh, a certain size, a certain resolution in mind to drive the zoom functionality. Um, and, and here is uh, an example of when we did this one, uh, we wanted to show the end mill from the end on because this highlights the fact that this is a center cutting end mill. So you can, you can actually use this tool to drill straight down into a surface because of how the cutting edges are aligned. That's really only visible from this angle. Um, so we actually had, when I was at Amazon and we took these images, we intentionally designed each of them to, to uh, around a particular feature or element of the product that was highlighted in each one of those images. And all of them, as you can see here, are zoomable. These are all ultra high resolution, even the secondary images. You can even see the grind marks and the relief angles on the different cutting edges. Uh, to be honest, uh, we had some blown up shots of these uh, in the Amazon business uh, office when I was there as just wall art, because they're beautiful. Um, yeah, those are really nice. And I really appreciate the multiple angles that are provided when these sites do provide them. I know when I was shopping for my tents, there was a lot of PDP images, including the inside, the outside, how to set up, what it looks like when it's packed. All of those things are key in helping make a good buying decision. And it really helped my confidence when I picked up my tent. It's really a holdover from brick and mortar. Right? Back in the day, you would just go pick something off the shelf, hold it in your hand, you could, hold, you could spin it at any angle. You can't do that in digital. So secondary images is a way to offer that same sort of discovery experience and that, again, reinforce the confidence of the information you're presenting uh, and, and improve the user's uh, likelihood of actually buying the product. Very true. But there's a challenge to that, <clears throat> right? <laughs> like, yes, uh, it, it, it's, the images you have are only as good as the images you can get. And most of us are not going to go out and shoot uh, images on everything. So we have to, you know, Chantal, you've had the experience of going out and trying to get images from suppliers. Uh, what's that like? Yes, when I was at Granger, we had to obtain images from many different suppliers. And just that communication alone, trying to get those images from the suppliers was a lot of work. And then trying to get the consistency of the image, images was just absolutely, uh, it was a headache. And trying to get all of that into one, one location from multiple locations, it's just there's a lot of effort. But then your images are free. So there is a benefit to going that way. Right. By the same tokens, like some companies, some people have recognized that this is a problem. And, and there are organizations out there that, that kind of pool content, including images from a number of different suppliers, into a uh, a source that can be used to help you accelerate this process 
Uh, some buying groups um, have developed uh, pools like this that are shared amongst their members. Uh, there are even some organizations out there that you know, just offer data pools of industrial product, you know, like IDEA has this on the, um, on the electrical side. Uh, there are other companies that do this just you know, for money. And it's a subscription service, and you can sign up. You have to spend a little bit more you know, every month in order to get access to this feed, but it does help you ramp it up and accelerate it more quickly. A couple of them are starting to kind of shoot some of their own images, which is interesting, um, but it's still, it's still primarily supplier source. But it's, it's a faster way to, to, to get a baseline. Yes, and then of course, the best way to get the most control and the best quality of your product images is to take your own pictures. Uh, then you can make sure you have great images for your customers. You can have as many pictures as you like, and it's really, uh, really adds to that user experience. It's pricier, it takes more time, but it's so beneficial to your customers. So when you want to raise that bar and go customize with your images, though, there is a lot you need to think about. Uh, Jason, what are some of those things that people need to think of before they start rushing into a custom imaging program? True. Like we just saw, you know, when you bring in secondary, tertiary, you know, second, third, fourth images, you're taking more images of each SKU, and you want to bring more SKUs into the program. You need a way of scaling, right? You're, this is going to be beyond – you know, you sending Bobby the intern out into the warehouse with an iPhone uh, <laughs> to take pictures, you may want to bring in freelance photographers. You may want to work with uh, maybe some people that are on light duty. So the really important thing is to create product style guides. These are written documents that capture what are the images you need to take, why are you trying to take them, and what are the features that you really need to, need to capture. These tools are incredibly helpful to giving you access to kind of incremental temporary uh, capacity uh, and, are, and are essential to maintaining that consistency over time. And there's really two kinds of style guides. There's a global style guide, which is, all right, these are all kind of like the technical aspects of the images. What file types do we expect? Is there a maximum file size? Uh, do we accept, does it, does it need to be a file itself, or can we accept what's called a dynamic link? The manufacturer sends me, oh, here's a link to where this image lives on our server. What do we want the backgrounds to look like? Do we want to mandate it's pure white or not? Uh, do we need to, what are the minimum dimensions we want to create in order to support the zoom functionality of our different channels? And then lastly, what are the file names? Like if it's going to be a file that we're going to accept, we don't want everybody to have different file naming conventions. You want to establish a standard. Very true. And then we get over to the category specific style guide. And this is drilling into what you want to see on your PDP pages. You're going to want rules in place for the number of images and how each of those images should be shot and why. Um, what are you trying to specifically highlight with each of those images? So when we were looking at those end mills, the first shot we saw was that corner to corner shot, which was the primary. And then we saw different angles in the following shots in a very consistent order. And each of those shots is very intentional. It highlights a very specific feature of the product. And really, all those rules need to be documented and governed in this style guide uh, so you know what you're providing to your, to your customers. And if you don't know why you're taking a particular picture of the product, then you probably shouldn't even be taking it. Oh, that's a great point. Great point. Um, the format of a style guide, you know, like the, the global style guide is usually just a bunch of paragraphs. It's a requirements document. You know, it's just like what, are the, what, are, what is the resolution with the file size? But when category specific, it's usually a little bit of a combo. You have a little introduction, what the product is, so the user, so the whoever's doing it is familiar. And then each image that you shoot, what, is, what are the specs on that image? What's the angle? Um, and then also, like, what's the feature you're trying to highlight? Why is that image important? And, and where, what are the things that need to be consistent or different over time? And at the end, you know, a little summary on any sort of exceptional technical things like lighting setups, lens types, are we using, are, are we using macro photography or not, any other sort of quirky considerations that are important, write it down. Make sure that the next person who does the next job knows how to do it as well as you do. So... Really quick, we got, uh, I mean, the, the key takeaways here, Chantal, what do you think? What are your, what are your big ones? And uh, my big one is just the importance of product images. There's a lot of companies that kind of brush them under the table because of the effort. You need to have them. Yeah, and also, you don't have to boil the ocean. Start with the ones you can get. Work your way up to customs. 
And finally, just be thoughtful about it. This is an opportunity to differentiate yourself. So figure out what that is and write it down in a product strategy rule book. Very true. So, uh, well, thank you for joining us. I hope you can come to our next episode where we're going to talk about um, how to stop hiding your product in your taxonomy. And um, thank you for joining us. It was a wonderful time. And we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.